off by thanking the friends of the Tulsa City County Libraries for sponsoring today's program. If you are interested in more information about how to become a friend of the library, simply visit tulsalibrary.org friends. Remember, if you have any questions throughout today's program, you can type your questions into the chat feature. Our speaker will answer audience questions following her presentation. And now I'd like to welcome Arlene Chemmers. Arlene is a retired vice president of a management consulting firm and certified professional career and retirement coach. She holds a lifetime certification as a senior professional in human resources. In addition to Arlene's professional certification, she has extensive experience as a trainer, consultant, and leader in the corporate, academic, management consultant, outplacement, and nonprofit environments. A popular workshop facilitator, she is the proud co-author of a book entitled The Empty Desk Survival Guide for Women on the Verge of Retirement or Encore Careers. She has a love for reading, travel, and volunteering. Please join me in welcoming Arlene. Well, hi, everybody. I am absolutely thrilled to have been asked to make this presentation. And I want to start with a couple disclaimers, which I know is not the right way to start. One is that, yes, that photograph that I submitted to the brochure is me. It was just a younger version of me, uh, in case you're saying, well, that doesn't look like her. Also, I do have a script here, uh, which I will be referring to, and there's a, two purposes for that. One is to help me keep within the time frame that we have, uh, and the other is because our author, Danny Shapiro, has peppered her memoirs with so many powerful um, uh, quotes and statements about uh, uh, the, the um, um, investigation and uh, transformation she went through that I didn't want to miss um, sharing the flavor of, of that with you. So um, I will get started and um, uh, hope that I can entice you to want to read this book. Um, so we're talking about the book Inheritance a memoir of genealogy, paternity and love. The author is Danny Shapiro and it is a New York Times bestseller. Um, I've just uh, uh, set up her description of the author in two sections. One is her professional uh, identity and I use that word purposefully. She's a very talented, best-selling author. She's written five novels and six memoirs. She's a professor at both Columbia NYU, NYU, excuse me, the New School and Wesleyan University and a co-founder of a writer's conference called Sirenland in Italy. She's a known essayist, um, got tongue-tied, and journalist, and her writings appear in many esteemed publications. She's also originated and hosts two podcasts on iHeartRadio. One is called Family Secrets, and it's for those uh, listeners who she discovers have called themselves donor conceived, and you will understand that as we go through the uh, memoir. And the other uh, podcast is The Way We Live Now, which is a daily podcast of how the virus is changing and affecting us. This book has also been a finalist in two awards, Goodread Choice Awards and Wingate Prize. So that's her professional identity. Her personal identity is that she's a wife, a mother, a devoted daughter and granddaughter. Her memoirs deal with the themes of identity and family history. She says that writing memoirs is her way of making sense of herself and the world around her. The, and this is her quote, the process by which I come to understand what I feel think and know. 
She lives with her husband, Michael Marin, a journalist and screenwriter who plays a big part in this journey they take, and a te teenage son named Jacob in Litchfield County, Connecticut. Now, my interest in this book is twofold. One is because I was raised in the Jewish faith, as was Danny. Although she was raised in a strict Orthodox tradition and her father's ancestors who were from very illustrious and well-known Orthodox Jewish family. Second, in my professional life as a career coach and a professional, certified professional coach and career transition coach, I always help my clients answer the three career development questions of life, the first one was always, who am I? Now, the way we determine who to answer, how to answer that question is that we used um, assessment tools that brought in exercises that brought out their uh, values, their interests, their skills, and their strengths. But later on, as I worked with this question, I grew to understand that it was a very spiritual question, because when you figure out who am I and answer that, excuse me, that question for yourself, you are really identifying and discovering what your purpose is for being here. I consider that a spiritual question. So Danny was faced with this deeper, more spiritual question because her situation called into question what she considered her entire identity as she believed herself to be at 54 years old. Her identity encompassed her total being and that was her upbringing, her parents, her religion, her culture, her tradition, and it goes, the list goes on and on. The language she spoke, the languages she spoke, her values, beliefs, lifestyles, memories, imaginations, and of course, her ancestry of a Jewish line lineage was of most important to her. In fact, in Hebrew, there's an expression, Lador Vador, and what it means is from generation to generation. It's a very important tradition to name your newborn child after a deceased relative in order to keep their spirit alive. And here's a, some quotes from Danny. Everything I know to be true is related to facts of family. So it is in this ancient culture that Danny has formed a very strong connection to her ancestors, her father, and her inheritance. Now, I know you may not know the story yet, but this is all leading up to it for you. Now, in planning this review, it was quite a challenge when I sat down to try to do it, because this is not a novel with a sequential plot that's, you know, can be followed. It's rather a real-time memoir that she wrote almost like a daily diary of her journey through a very daunting and traumatic experience. It was described as an emotional and transformational journey and investigation on a quest to discover the truth of her identity when suddenly the knowledge of her identity was shattered. The book has 50 chapters and four parts, and none of them have any kind of a label. And so, <laughs> What I ended up doing to hopefully facilitate this discussion is I um, uh, categorized four major themes and I will try to, um, to summarize them appropriately for you to understand the whole story. So the quick synopsis, so I don't keep, keep you waiting any longer, to provide a framework for what I'm trying, going to try to fill in. She was raised by Orthodox Jews. Danny had been questioned all her life about her ethnicity because she had blonde hair and blue eyes. She looked very Nordic and she was told over and over again she did not look Jewish. 
Then in her mid fifties, she received shocking news after taking a DNA test on a whim and discovers that the father who she totally identified with, who raised her and cared for her, was not her biological father. Now I tried to lay the groundwork for you so you'd understand how that was so shocking to her because she had a total connection to her father. The memoir Inheritance reads like a mystery novel as she tries to navigate this shocking news and put herself back together because her sense of self had been broken apart. Those were her words. The memoir is also peppered with occasional excerpts of literature, poetry, philosophy, and theology. She says, who am I if not connected to my father? She says, by the time I went to bed, the night of the discovery, my entire history, the life I had lived had crumbled beneath me like the buried ruins of an ancient forgotten city. That gives you a little insight into the way she writes. Who am I if not connected to my father? So before I get started with my summary of the themes, I have three questions I want to ask you to keep in mind so that in our chat section, hopefully we can uh, get to some of your answers. Throughout the memoir, Danny raises a variety of questions, all different ways of asking the same question, who am I? Some of her questions are, what makes us who we are? How do we determine our, our identity? What do you believe makes you you? Is who we are who we believe ourselves to be? Am I who I thought I was? And in terms of relationships, she worried. Do you see me as the same person? Am I going to lose you? So these questions are peppered all the way through the 40 chapters as she searches for her identity and to put herself back together. Here's my three questions for you. One, what defines who you are? Two, what's the most significant factor that determines who you are? Obviously, I've laid it out for you that ancestry and religion was utmost important for Danny. How, number three, how do you think you'd react if this had happened to you? So here's my four themes. And I believe these are the most important um, things that Danny was trying to surface. Self-identity, number one. Number two, family secrets. Number three, her actual investigation. And number four, how she resolved this and the issue of paternity and love. So that would be taking you through the um, book. Theme one, search for identity. So I've already described in my um, introduction of the author is who she thought she was, uh, both professionally and personally. What I think I need to add in this section is that she had a very unusual relationship with her parents. For her mother, she was not close to her mother. She described her mother in several places as a narcissistic personality who was self-centered and cold. She treated Danny as an object, not a person, and as a prize. Danny did not like her mother and confesses that she was sometimes afraid of her. She says that she formed herself in opposition to her mother and therefore closely identified with her father. In terms of her relationship with her father, her, as I already mentioned, her entire sense of self was formed and shaped by her father to whom she was devoted and learned the strict Jewish Orthodox upbringing. 
sharing the religious heritage and traditions was how she related to her father, who was frequently depressed. This was explained by what she called a sad adult life. He was divorced from an unhappy arranged marriage and had a daughter who was Danny's believed half sister. Uh, his second wife, who was the love of his life, died after just a few months of marriage. And so Danny's mother was his third wife. She says she never felt that she totally belonged, but did not know why. Part of it was her uh, physical features. She didn't look like any of the family members. She always felt like an outlier. She felt like there was some secret being hidden from her all her life. We're ready to go to theme two, which was family secret uncovered. So she received the shock of her life when three separate things happened all at once in terms of discovering her ancestry. ancestry. She describes herself as shattered and deconstructed. The three things are, one, her test results from Ancestry.com came back confirming she was not biologically related to her father. Imagine how shattering that was under the circumstances. Number two, her half-sister, who was the daughter of the first marriage of her father, did the test also, and it came back confirming that they did not have the same father. And number three, once her ancestry um, results were, um, were uh, set up on the computer, she heard from an unknown cousin um, uh, connected to the other results. Well, the way I look at that, I think Danny experienced uh, loss and grief, much like the five uh, stages of Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross's five stages of loss and grief. For sure, I could trace denial and anger, and at the end, acceptance. Denial, she just could not believe that this was true, especially since she was so connected with her um, dad. She remembered though then a comment her mother had made offhanded about her being conceived in Philadelphia, not born, but conceived in Philadelphia. At the time, she didn't pay too much attention to it, but now she rethinks this and determines that if she had a different biological father, it must have been artificial insemination from the way her mother uh, talked about it when she did. But she knew that that was probably forbidden by the strict Jewish laws. It was very important for her to believe that her parents didn't know the truth, or at least that her mother had deceived her father. She went to several rabbis to try to determine the Jewish law on um, artificial insemination in order to try and absolve her father of actually knowing. She went to her mother's friend, her father's sister, her rabbi, a friend of rabbi, a rabbi friend, to try and confirm any of this information or that it could even be true. She was never able to determine if her parents knew or not. Anger was that she felt so deceived and angry at her parents that if they knew she had been lied to all her life. Theme three, investigation. And I divided the investigation into two parts because she actually ended up investigating two things. One, of course, was the search for her biological father. And two, she started getting interested in the whole industry, uh, especially in the 1960s, of artificial insemination. 
she describes herself as having a crisis of the soul. Who was I without my history? How was I to make sense of the rest of my life? So the search for her biological father, using the internet, her husband's investigative reporting skills, genealogy experts that she just happened to know, and Ancestry.com, they said about their dogged investigation. Well, because of uh, Danny's remembrance of her mother's comment, she decided to look into uh, infertility clinics of the 60s. They identified a fertility institute um, in 1960 in Philadelphia that operated through Penn State. They were told that the concept or the technique of sperm mixing was a very common thing to do in those days and that possibly, probably, the medical students at Penn State were the donors. They researched medical students at the time and were able to identify one who was related to the mysterious cousin that showed up. They found Danny's biological father in just 36 hours. Absolutely amazing. I doubt anybody else could have done that. And he was a 43-year-old retired medical doctor with a wife, three grown children, and he lectured on medical ethics. This was very ironic to me and probably to her because she was just getting interested in studying was there even any medical ethics at the time about in infertility and here he was lecturing on it. So she was able to go right to his videos and, uh, and observe them and at once, at once, she says she noticed a familiarity. They looked alike. They had the same features, the same coloring, the same eye color, the same cheekbones. The, the, she recognized his voice, his mannerisms when he lectured, the way he uh, gesticulated when he was trying to make a point. And she says, she finally saw the truth. So she decides that she's going to contact Ben in spite of advice from the others in the know against it. But knowing her tenacity, she had to dig deeper. So after she did contact him and uh, spring the news on him, and after what she considered agonizing, absolutely agonizing weeks where she was checking her email all the time, his response was no, he was not interested in connecting, although he did understand the desire to share medical information. She did have a mention in one of her aunt memoirs that her son had a very serious life-threatening medical situation when he was an infant, they almost lost him. And she had at the time no idea that it could be anything genetic. And now there's a possibility she had all the wrong medical history. So that was one of her dilemmas. Well, she decided to be patient and her husband assured her that that was not going to be the end of the of the communication, and sure enough, months later, she gets another message from uh, the man she named Ben. Of course, these are aliases. Um, said that after consulting his wife and family, he would agree to some communication. Now she had already understood that he would be very suspicious about her message. And so she had cleverly sent him all of her websites and podcasts and videos, and she knew he would probably um, view them 
and maybe feel more comfortable about her. And yes, four months later, she and her husband and Ben and his wife met for lunch. She did say that she was very comfortable with the whole um, experience and that it filled in a piece of her that had been missing. Later, she connected with his daughter, which uh, who is Danny's biological half-sister, and they discovered they had a great deal in common. Interesting. The second part of investigation beside the search for her biological father was, as I mentioned, the research she did on artificial insemination. She felt very negative about the idea. She uncovered many ethical questions she considered as the consequences of this practice of fertility treatment and DNA testing, the process of secrecy, the consequences and anguish of being a donor conceived child. Hence the, um, the podcast she set up later, which was a brand new word to her because what she discovered after meeting some of these people, donor conceived children, and I guess there's a lot of them in today's world, that they intuitively know something is missing, that they don't fit in or something is missing, just like Danny did. But in searching, she discovers that her parents must have been betrayed, that it, uh, they were told it was a treatment and they asked no questions. The publisher has a comment on the ethics of this, which I put in my notes. We live in a moment where science and technology have outplaced medical ethics and the capacities of the human heart to contend with the consequences of what we discover. So basically she was realizing that what they started to do in the 60s had not been uh, the consequences of how that would affect the actual children or the donors or the family in which um, who, who received the donors, the ethical questions about all of that. So now I'm at theme four. And that was resolution. And part of resolution is a description of paternity and love. She did go through a journey that I would call of transformation over time as she gathered information of what makes our identities and attachments. She started from a shocked, broken self to a different understanding of herself. So in a way, I look at that as the last stage of the grief uh, phases where um, I can call it resolution, but it's also acceptance. And so I divided this part in uh, this section into sort of three parts. She had to forgive her parents and lose her anger. And so, she put things in perspective finally, and you can trace this uh, as you read the memoir, how she changes her point of view from chapter one to chapter 40, because she realized that the world of 1961 was very different than the world of today, as the publishers mentioned, and that um, she uh, acknowledged, she called herself a present, present, presentist, like the word present. And she describes that as someone who introduces current day ideas and perspectives into interpretations of the past. So when looking back at 1960, she realized a whole different set of circumstances existed. She couldn't understand why would her father agree to this? And she refused to believe again, that her parents would knowingly participate in deceiving her. And so she decided to um, use a different framework in which to, um, to perceive this and to forgive 
her parents for the deception and to lose her anger. She thinks her mother must have felt fear and shame and a great desire to have a child. And that of course, her father would want to make his wife happy. And so um, the, after all, she talks about God told Abraham, Abraham, be fruitful and multiply. And that's a big part of the tradition. The second thing, living with the new information. So now she could ask herself, who am I now? She answers, you are the same person. You just changed your understanding of who you are. She went through some symbolic changes to integrate both of her new identity or her old identity with her new identity. She had a swallow tattoo uh, tattooed on her shoulder, which to her, the bird signified uh, a sign of liberation and freedom and freedom from the secret that had held her down, not knowing why she was different. And then she changed her legal name where her mother had given her the name D-A-N-E-I-L to Danny. Uh, and she didn't ever, ever, excuse me, she didn't ever like that name. So she changed it legally to Danny Shapiro. The last topic under resolution was paternity and love, accepting the person who was now called her social father. She had to answer who was her father? What makes a parent a parent? She says, I have one father, the dad who raised me, who loved me, who cared for me, who nurtured me and formed much of who I am. I loved him then and I love him now. In fact, she dedicated the book to that father. And that is the end of my presentation. How did we do on time? Good. We have seven minutes left for questions. So you were pretty much right on the mark. Okay, good. Good. Uh, so we have one question from the chat from Sue Ann. Has the author connected with more family members on her biological father's side? I didn't quite get the question. Has the author connected with more family members on her biological father's side? Uh, I, I don't believe she has. Um, the only information I would have is from a question and answer she did with an audience. I know she's um, connecting with her stepsister. They have a lot in common, a great deal in common. Um, and she possibly has met her stepbrothers. And of course, she has a relationship with his wife, with Ben's wife. I don't believe that she did anything else. Okay, we also have a question uh, for you. Did Shapiro's book change your own ideas about artificial insemination? Oh, wow. <laughs> I, uh, I don't really know. I um, haven't thought about it very much. I can understand uh, people needing to do that when they are uh, childless. Um, I personally went through something like that. I never had artificial insemination, but I had a very difficult time um, um, having children. Uh, and um, I, um, I think, however, her issue was more um, in, uh, in not sharing all the information with the clients at the time of the 60s. And she really found out through someone who was a doctor at the time that they did not tell the parents, they did not tell the parents they mixed the sperm or they did not tell the parents sometime they substituted the sperm. And it was that ethical question. Um, someone wants to know more about how this experience affected Danny's religious identity. Well, I, I believe my understanding is, excellent question, that um, she never really considered herself the very strict Orthodox Jew, 
but she honored it because of her father. And now I forgot to mention in my discussion, both her parents were deceased. So when she found this out at 54 years old, so she couldn't go and even ask them questions. Um, so I they think that once he passed away, she uh, uh, approached her religion in a much more uh, modern, modern way. Um, someone wants to know if you have any more thoughts about the distance between Danny and her mother. Well, I thought it was really um, um, revealing that she was so open in her memoir to talk about, um, you know, her very dysfunctional, poor relationship. Again, her mother has passed away when, when she wrote this memoir. I don't know that she would have been able to write that if her mother was still alive, but she mentions in several of the chapters, even in talking to other people who knew her mother, they all seem to agree that she was an unhappy, dysfunctional person. Okay, I have a question. Um, you've made it clear that the book was very popular um, and got a lot of acclaim. Is there, what about the book do you think resonates with such a big audience? Well, I think the question of self-identity, I really, I really think, um, that um, we all search for who we are or who we think we are. And this was a total uh, in, uh, emotional investigation on her part when, when which, who she thought she was, which was her, which grounded her, was shattered totally. And she had to rebuild that, which is, I think in our lives and my, my professional life as a coach and career counselor. And so even when I do retirement coaching, we have to always ask ourselves, who am I? And it changes. If you don't ask yourself every five years, who am I now? You're missing a whole lot of how you are transforming and evolving. So do we have time to ask the audience if they could answer my three questions? Sure, we have a couple minutes. Does anybody have an answer to, uh, to my three questions? One was, how do you define yourself? The other was, uh, uh, what's the most significant factor? And how do you think you'd react? I'll accept any, uh, any answers to any of those three. Yes, feel free to put your answers in the chat. Nobody wants to. <laughs> it's pretty weighty, weighty set of questions. It's, it's very weighty, which is, you know, to my um, point about why the book, I think, resonates so much. While we're waiting to see if anyone can put together a response, do you have any suggestions for how to start the process of answering that question for yourself? Like, is there a reflection exercise you could do? Oh, or... well, well, yeah, I have a whole book on it. But... <laughs> <Quickly>. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, in career development, who am I? But, uh, you know, I'm going to just add that now when I do retirement coaching, I always say, who am I now? Because you have to reevaluate. But it's asking yourself, uh, you know, what, what do I value? What are my values? What are my interests or passions? Um, you know, what are my strengths? What do I like to do? And, uh, and, and, and skills. And if you put all those three things together and you're really open about it, not because I'm doing this because my mother set me on that, uh, that trek when I was 10, but who am I now? You know, what do I like now? What am I interested in now? What am I drawn to? To find out your passion. Because as I said, to me, it becomes a very spiritual question. If you follow the energy and you follow your passion, you usually will know why you're here, which is spiritual question one. 
Why am I here? I think that's very profound. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a few people kind of sharing some things in the chat, not exactly answers to your question, but more like thoughts. Okay. So somebody uh, recommends The Lost Family by Libby Copeland as another book about DNA uh, surprises. Somebody says that their family found a new secret branch of the family when a cancer study was done. And then we also have someone in the audience who wanted to thank you for the thought provoking questions. They will continue to think about them. <laughs> and I, I echo what they say. I'll be thinking about those questions after this session. Okay. okay, well, if we have a minute, I can tell you the three career development questions are, you know, who am I or who am I now? What do I want and how do I get there? And that's ends up with an action plan and then that helps a person follow a career direction but the spiritual questions are why am i here uh, oh i forgot the other one just a minute i wrote it down. uh why oh, oh why uh who am i why am i here and how shall i love that's fascinating. Well, I encourage everyone to check out her book if you want more in this vein, because it sounds like your book goes into a lot more detail about this whole process. And I'm sure a lot of people right now are looking for a new career path just because of COVID. So <laughs> it was like the perfect time to start thinking about these kinds of things. But that is our time. I wanted to thank you so much for being with us today. You did a wonderful job and the book sounds fascinating. Well, it was my absolute pleasure. Uh, again, thank you so much for asking me to do it. I enjoyed the exercise of sort of um, consolidating it, uh, but uh, I would uh, encourage people to read it. And she's a marvelous writer and or listen to her podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arlene. Be sure to join us next week for our next session in the Book Sandwiched In series. We'll be hearing from Hillary Kitts, who trained at Madeline Kamon's The Modern Gourmet Cooking School. She'll be discussing Save Me the Plums, My G Gourmet Memoir by Ruth Reichel. So that should be a lot of fun. Thank you again, Arlene, and I hope everyone has a lovely day. Thank you all. Thank you for listening.